Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, or uh, at least traditionally, I'm your host, uh, John DeLynn. It's April 9th, 2019. Uh, we have a few just super quick announcements, and I promise to make them super quick. Uh, tomorrow, April 10th at 7 p.m., Community of Christ, I'll be doing a free workshop in the continuing series on helping people navigate a faith crisis. We'll be talking about rebuilding your life after a faith crisis. This weekend, uh, April 12th and 13th, Julie Azevedo Hanks and I are co-leading uh, a, a retreat for mixed faith marriages. We're super excited about that. There are a few spots left, so go to mormonfaithcrisis.com slash events if you want to register for that. Um, and then I have some kind of sobering news uh, that some of you are aware of. Um, one of the most important interviews of the past year, or I'd say potentially in the life of Mormon Stories podcast is my interview with uh, Leah and Cody and Brinley Young. It's this phenomenal family in Columbus, Ohio, who uh, uh, did an interview talking about their faith journey, uh, their loss of faith in Mormonism and how they've handled that as humans and as parents. Uh, we found out last week that Cody and Leah have been called to a disciplinary council uh, specifically for um, uh, creating a support group. So it's not uh, for, you know, anything that they've said. Uh, it's not for any any act uh, other than uh, when they were lonely, when they were sad, when they were struggling in Columbus without any community or support after, you know, stopping their church attendance. They formed a, uh, a Facebook group to support progressive and post-Mormons in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, it's a small group. It's a very positive group. It's a very healing group. Uh, but, uh, you know, a month or however long ago, they were called in uh, by their stake president and told that if they didn't disband the group, uh, they would be excommunicated. And, uh, you know, they, they responded very graciously and lovingly by inviting the stake president and stake presidency and bishops to come to the support group so they could see that it wasn't an anti-Mormon group. It wasn't an apostate group. It was purely a support group for people who were uh, alone or sad or uh, just lonely and needed friendship. And uh, the stake presidency declined to attend uh, any of the support meetings. And then in a letter uh, just a few days ago, uh, Cody and Leo were notified that uh, a disciplinary council would be held. That's going to be April 14th uh, in the evening. I believe it's at 6.30. Um, I could have that time wrong. Uh, but if you want to find a way to support uh, Brindley uh, and uh, Cody and Leah and their wonderful family, I'm sure they would love uh, any expressions of support that you have for them through email or text, um, th through however you want to show them your appreciation. If, if people want to uh, either come to Columbus, Ohio, uh, to the event, to the Stake Center, like we did for Bill Real, like we did for Sam Young, uh, like we've tried to do for Jeremy Runnels and anyone who faces excommunication, uh, I'm sure that support would be welcome. If folks want to find a way over social media or in their own geographical, lo geographical locations, if they want to find a way to show their support uh, for uh, Leah and Cody and Brindley Young and their wonderful family. I encourage you to do so. Um, you know, we understand that the church can can feel scared sometimes uh, to have progressive and post-Mormons forming community, but we see this as a really unfortunate turn. Um, so we would love uh, the Youngs to feel your love and support as much as possible. So please do what you can to love and support them. Uh, June 7th through 9th, we're having a Thrive Conference in Salt Lake City, uh, which is an event 100% focused on healing and joy and growth for post-Mormons. We have such an amazing lineup of speakers, Natasha Alfred Parker, Margie uh, Delin, uh, David Bakavoy, uh, Julie Azevedo hanks uh, uh, so many cool speakers. I don't have the list with me now. Um, uh, Jenny Morrow is going to be there. 
so many others. If you are looking for um, healing and growth and community, uh, going through a faith crisis, we're going to spend a whole weekend doing that and celebrating it. So if you want to go to mormonfaithcrisis.com slash events, there's a link to all these events. Uh, these events aren't officially sponsored by the Open Stories Foundation. Uh, they're sponsored right now by the Center for uh, Religious and Secular Progress, uh, which is separate from the OSF. But uh, please go to uh, that page if you want to register for any of these events. Uh, we've had over 50 people already register for the Thrive event. We only have 90 slots available. So uh, please come. Uh, if you're interested, we'd love to have you. So that's all for the announcements. Um, normally I'm, I'm, uh, it's, it's usually my habit to say I'm super excited for m all my interviews today. I'm not going to say that because I don't feel that <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel super excited for today's interview. Um, several weeks ago or a month ago, I don't know how long ago, Margie just, uh, said to me, Hey John, I really want to interview you. And I was really taken back by that for a couple of reasons. One is because, uh, you know, Margie's usually been very private and, uh, you know, she's been willing to come on Mormon stories to do her own interview, uh, which is one of my favorite interviews of all time, not because she's my wife and I love her, but because of the wisdom she shares on that interview. And I know how many people have reached out to say how much that interview meant to her. But aside from that interview, Margie has not been on a lot of Mormon stories episodes, if at all. Um, we do do the Gift of the Mormon Faith Crisis podcast together with Natasha Helfer Parker. Um, but uh, but Margie hasn't been on Mormon Stories. and But anyway, when she showed an interest in interviewing me or coming on Mormon Stories podcast as a, as a host, I was thrilled uh, from that perspective, but I'm, I'm not thrilled to be interviewed. Uh, I, I don't feel like being interviewed. I don't want to be interviewed <laughs> right now. That's not how I'm feeling, but I'm not going to turn my, my, uh, my wonderful, brilliant wife down when she shows interest. So, uh, so I'm torn and uh, conflicted about this interview, but I'm going to, I'm going to turn the time over to Margie Delin as she is going to sit in the, uh, interview interviewer chair and interview me and I'll just say, why in the heck did you want to do this? <laughs> <laughs> it's a valid question, babe. It really is. Um, well, I think I'm, I'm newer to the space and I'm definitely newer to social media and how it works. And I think, um, because of that, I have been noticing how, um, you're portrayed and how oftentimes you're talked about or how you're seen, which is very, like, I don't think you're seen in an incorrect way at all. I just think it's not really a whole multidimensional way all the time. So I just thought this would be a great way to humanize you a little bit and to kind of fill out some of those spaces. And you're in really good hands with me. <laughs> and it's a way to do it kind of gently with someone who knows you and loves you. And so it will be okay. So you want to humanize me. <laughs> <laughs> fill out, fill you out a little bit, right? I think Mormon stories is part of what you do and it's clearly part of who you are. Um, and the real magic of Mormon stories is clearly the stories. Uh, but this is a way just to have a little fun. <sighs> All right. Well, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, Do your worst. <laughs> so I came up with these questions. There are, I think, 28 total. We're not going long form today. I, I myself don't do four-hour interviews. Um, but what I will say is, um, you know, these questions I came up with um, on my own. And so we're going to kind of start off with a like a warm-up question. Just a warm-up fun. We're going to let you just kind of put your feet in gently. Okay. 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 <laughs> so you love anyone who knows you knows that you love Baskin Robbins. <laughs> so it's kind of a yummy treat place for you. What are, what are some of your favorite flavors at Baskin Robbins, John Delin? <laughs> 
Well, I have two go-to flavors at Baskin Robbins, Margie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, do tell. Um, daiquiri ice. So, so my mom uh, noticed that we had milk allergies as kids, and so she often, for many many years, wouldn't let me uh, have milk-based ice cream. So I developed a love for daiquiri ice, which is uh, a standard uh, non-dairy ice cream flavor at Baskin Robbins. And I also later developed a love for mint chocolate chip. So yesterday I had a mint chocolate chip <gasps> uh, shake yesterday? at Baskin Robbins. <laughs> and those are my two favorite Baskin Robbins flavors. Well, thank you. <laughs> That's a good day. Well done. Well, okay. So we're going to... One question that I thought would be a great way to start uh, was just kind of follow a follow-up, right, to the excommunication process and how that, you know, we're years out now. Uh, I know with the youngs, uh, you know, emotions always kind of come to the surface for, I feel like, the both of us really, um, when another excommunication comes up, but, you know. So what was most surprising to you about the process of excommunication? It can be something you maybe you hadn't anticipated or something just, you know, straight out was surprising. Um, there are probably a couple things about that, about the excommunication. I think that um, I went into it with a lot of, let's just say, energy and confidence um, we'll talk about movies later, but, you know, I always wanted to stand for a cause from a very young age. I always wanted to stand for a cause. I was inspired by Martin Luther King Jr. growing up and Gandhi. Uh, I always regretted that I couldn't be a part of, you know, the civil rights movement in the, in the sixties when it was happening. So I went into the excommunication sort of with that being this culmination of, you know, being punished for something I believed in or standing for a cause, which sounds, uh, you know, as I'm hearing myself say it, it sounds prideful or it sounds, um, you know, a little bit egoist, egotistical. Uh, but I, but I, you know, felt like my intentions were sincere, that I was standing for LGBT Mormons, for same-sex marriage, for, uh, you know, I had, I had just signed on to the ordained women sort of a website and and of course for a long time I had stood for doubting Mormons and questioning Mormons and for the church to be more transparent. So I I did feel like I was standing for things that mattered. Um but I think I was surprised at at how uh still hurtful it was. In other words, I thought it would just be a moment of confidence and of v and of uh, victory or vindication or whatever. And it was just really messy and hard. Mm -hmm. um, emotionally, it felt uh, really violent. Um, mm -hmm. Even though I think the, the men who did it were doing it from a sincere place. So I was surprised at how hard and hurtful it was. But I was also very glad I did it um, because it, it gave me closure instead of just resigning and being able to sort of have people say, well, he just resigned. For me, the, the, it left no doubt that, uh, the, the church in the way it was responding and to some degree kind of still is responding to challenges. It left me with no doubt that, uh, that I was doing the right thing and that, um, the church, I, let's just say had, has a ways to go in the way that it handles things. Mm -hmm. But then afterwards, and we can get into this when we talk about kids, I think I was probably careless about the effects that it would have on our kids mm -hmm. and on you um, and our relationship. And there are, uh, there are flowers that have grown out of that turd, let's just say, <laughs> And so I don't want to leave that ominously or negatively, mm -hmm. but um, I think all of us bear scars from the social 
and emotional ramifications of the excommunication. And I think all of us are in therapy or in coaching or in counseling in some ways, four years later, in part trying to heal from the social and emotional wounds of the excommunication. And, uh, and I think I... I think I had this naive confidence that if you stand for what you believe in, if you stand for what you think is right, that um, in the end it will always be a net positive. And I think, again, that was a little bit naive and careless. And I think the damage or the difficulties of, of the excommunication, uh, I, I didn't, I think I was careless. And I think I... I didn't fully grasp. You maybe what, underestimated. What cost, yeah. What the real cost would be to each of our kids, to you, to me, and to our relationship and to our family. It basically just introduces a lot of trauma to everyone, individually and collectively, that takes years to try and make sense of and heal from. Um, what do you love most about your Do you job? want to... Do you, in, in, as a part of this interview, do you want to respond? Oh, are we making it conversational? <laughs> you want me to respond? I, I want you to feel comfortable responding whenever you have responses that, that you'd like to share. Because well, I think if there's one thing for sure, our audience, this audience loves you and respects you. <laughs> and so I will always welcome your wisdom. Well. If you're willing to share. Or vulnerability or whatever. Um. I think the only thing I would say from that, I think I share in, um, you know, what you're talking about with regard to the impact maybe that it had. There's a reason why I think it was one of my fears kind of going into, um, and I, I think I underestimated some of the, the ways in which it would go down. What I would say is, you know, for me, I see a lot of, you know, from our wounds, oftentimes we, it, the wounds give birth to attributes or sensitivities that then become gifts. And I do see that with our children who now are highly compassionate about anyone who's othered or, um, you know, uh, may not share the amount of privilege that, that they have. I think they're very aware of things like that. So, um, you know, I, I definitely, it's a mixed bag, right? From, from suffering and from painful experiences, I think, uh, there are wounds and then there are gifts. So. Yeah. And we sh we shouldn't minimize the gifts that have come out of the excommunication, but it's hard to see your kids and your family suffer too. But it's also great to see them grow, but yeah. And they are growing and coming into their own now they're reckoning, yeah. you know? Yeah. Okay. So, um, what, it, what do you love most about your job? What do you love most about what you do? You've, you've had a number of jobs, so, in your adult life? Yeah. I, uh, I've mentioned this in other interviews, but one of the most inspiring movies to me growing up was a movie called You Can't Take It With You. It's by the same director that made It's a Wonderful Life and Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. His name's Frank Capra. And um, the basic premise of the movie is have a job that's meaningful because just making money isn't going to fulfill you and you can't take it with you when you die. So you may as well make the most of the time that you have. And I saw that as a BYU student, uh, in theater and film art analysis, one seventeen, with Charles Metten. And, uh, that movie just always stuck with me. I also saw it, uh, my brother, I think, well, my high school put it on when I was growing up. So I just always loved that movie and I took that with me. So as I, as I, advanced in my career at Microsoft and MIT and other places, I, I had financial and occupational success, but I w just got more and more depressed. So um, Mormon Stories was an outgrowth of me realizing I had to either 
find a meaningful job or I would implode emotionally. And you live that as you hear me talk about that. Uh, so I left Microsoft having no idea, just taking a massive, massive pay cut, having no idea what it would turn into. But I'm really, really grateful that I am at least for the past few years, and I've only been doing this full time three years, um, three and a half years. Uh, I'm just so grateful that I was able, I've been able for at least a few years to have a full time meaningful job where every day I don't question, I may question my effectiveness, I may question, uh, you know, mistakes I make or decisions I make or ways that I, uh, do or don't do harm, but I don't ever question that, uh, that this work is meaningful to people. You know, mm -hmm. it's basically trying to educate people about Mormonism past, present and future so that they can take control of their lives and engage in Mormonism or choose to not engage in Mormonism kind of with full consent and full knowledge. Uh, it, you know, when people are birthed from, let's say, Fowler Stage 3 Mormonism or Orthodox Mormonism or, un, you know, mindful Mormonism and are birthed out of that into either progressive liberal Mormonism that's a bit more informed and conscious or post-Mormonism, you know, what I hear from them either directly or or unspoken is thank you for giving me my life back. Thank you for bringing me to a higher level of consciousness about what I'm doing with my money, my time, uh, my energies. And I feel like, like I feel really good about helping people through that process. And my intent is never literally my intent has never been to lead people out of the church. Mm -hmm. Um, it's only been to help people see what they're a part of and engage in it or not engage in it with full knowledge. And then the the outgrowth from that, in the past it's been these workshops and retreats. Now it's the Gift of the Mormon Faith Crisis podcast and other things, the Thrive Conference. But there's this question of what's next that I think is has to be as important, it has to be more important than the work of awakening people. Because whether or not Mormon stories were to awake a lot of people, um, they would be awakened one way or another uh, because religion is d in decline in the Western world and we've relied on it for morality, for identity, for spirituality, for community, for family. And it's it's been the bedrock of civilization for centuries, whether it's Mormonism or Christianity or other things. And so, but now that it's, deteriorating and collapsing. Um, and it's not going to die, but it's certainly eroding. The fastest growing religious group is those who are no longer religious affiliated. And as of this year, it's also the largest religious group. So the single largest religious group in the U S is those who are not religious. Um, as that grows, we don't know how to build community with that religion. We don't know how to build identity sometimes with that religion. We don't know how to build spirituality with that religion, or at least we're very new or young at it as a species, as a, as a community, as a civilization. So I, uh, I don't doubt the value of that either. And so as imperfect as our work is and as new as our work is, I, I never, I get to wake up every morning knowing that I'm engaged in a work that is at least trying to be a positive difference in people's lives. And that's incredibly, it feels a little bit indulgent. It feels like a privilege, like a luxury because most people don't uh, get to uh, wake up with, with that being how they, you know, they have to make a living. They have to do whatever job they have and they're going to have some joy and not joy out of the job. But, um, you know, I think at least for the few years I've been able to do this, it's been incredibly rewarding to, to be that for people. So that's what I love about what I do. And, and of course the, the relationships and 
the impact on people that's I get the feeling that it's been overwhelmingly positive and then to have them come back and say, thank you, thank you, thank you Mm -hmm. for your positive impact in my life and in my family's life, whether it's saving lives, saving marriages, that never gets old to hear people say thank you for what the work of the Open Stories Foundation or Mormon Stories has meant to people. So that's a long answer, but it's, you know, next to family, it's the most important thing I do in life. So... Mm -hmm. Thanks for indulging me. (laughs) No, that's great. Do you know something that I really love about what you do that I think is really important? Tell me. Is I love this idea of the power of story. And I think Mormon stories really um, shines a light on that. And on a level, it, for many people, as they're going through, you know, a time when they're feeling very alone, we live kind of in a weird time where we have access to so many people and we're, you know, inundated, I think, with people's lives and personal, but we oftentimes can feel more isolated than ever. And I love this idea of people being met with a person's story. I can feel alone, but then I can, in one instant, hear someone's story and realize I'm really not alone. And it's a very intimate way and it's hard to argue with. It's a, a really, it's a very genius way of conveying nuance and, um, I don't know, complexity in a way that you can't, it's, it's difficult to refute someone's experience. And, it's, it, and you emotionally oftentimes connect with it. And that emotional connection, as we know, is what really influences people versus, you know, their rational kind of sense of things but yeah yeah i'm i'm super proud that i started with stories of all the things i could have started with i'm proud that i started with stories and i'm sure i'll end with stories (laughs) yeah yeah thank you for acknowledging that so um what is something that can be really difficult about your job there are a lot of things that are difficult about this job so like (laughs) there let me count the one one wouldn't do it justice yeah well, what's um, a standout or two? So um, the, the the hardest part about this job for me by far has been, and and the only way that it's survived and thrived has been uh, has been forming and running a nonprofit. So we started. So I did Mormon stories for pretty much no money, with no organization, from two thousand five to 2010. So about for about five years, there were a little bit of donations, but it was like pennies, <laughs> mm-hmm. pennies per hour for what I, I was putting into it. And, uh, and for many years received nothing. Um, but when I decided that I couldn't support my family as a grad student, when I got mm-hmm. my, you know, started grad school after that first year, and I missed it so much, I made a deal with my listeners that, I'd start a nonprofit, and if they would donate, not just to Mormon Stories, but to the cause of creating communities of support for listeners like you or whatever, you know, that that it would not just be a podcast they were donating to, but it would be a cause and even a movement, a movement of educating people about the church, a movement about forming community, a movement about creating other podcasts, all that stuff. Um, you know, because I, I feel like people want to support a, a cause and a movement. So, and I felt like a nonprofit would be the right organizational structure and it would allow people to donate, um, and to, and to get a tax deduction for their donations. It just felt like the right model and structure. But of course I'd never, I had volunteered, I'd worked on Sunstone's board of directors, but I'd never worked for a nonprofit. I didn't know how nonprofits were run. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what it took to run a nonprofit. I just, a lawyer filled out all the paperwork and then I read the basic rules like form a board, have regular board meetings, you know, uh, be responsible with your accounting, uh, report back to your donors every year what they donated, make sure you live the cause. So, I mean, so I, if I'm being just totally vulnerable and honest, I had no business starting a nonprofit in grad school Um, just because it's its own animal. And 
but I, but I didn't know of another way to do it. Um, and so I started the nonprofit and for those five years that I, uh, you know, did grad school full time and then the nonprofit part time and Mormon stories part time, uh, you know, we, we had boards, we had board meetings, we took minutes, we always, uh, we're super responsible with people's donations and money. And I'm proud that to this day, there's never been any financial question, mm -hmm. um, of note, uh, in or outside you know, we've been transparent while I'm grateful for all that. Um, and I'm proud of the, our impact. I never started Mormon stories to run a nonprofit. And, uh, and so, it's incredibly difficult to run a nonprofit. You're always fundraising. You're always trying to mm -hmm. make ends meet. Uh, boards, and, and I've handpicked my boards, and I've had the most amazing board members. Mm -hmm. But boards are boards are hard. At least I've had a hard time um, with boards, um, and not because my board members have been anything other than flawless. They really have been flawless, but um, I'm a very creative person. I'm a very opinionated person. I'm very kind of focused, and uh, I boards take care and feeding and love and support and empowerment. And uh, I trying to do all the you know, and but my heart has always been like number one with the podcast number two, with meeting one-on-one -on -one with people and having retreats and workshops, third, fourth, or fifth in my priority has been running a nonprofit and keeping my board, taking care of my board, making them feel healthy and appreciated. When we brought on staff, again, it was like, if I'm just, and this sounds terrible to say, when I brought on staff, it was like, what are the things I don't want to have to do so that I can focus on helping people in the podcast and, you know, fundraising. And, um, I, you know, in some sense, I had no business starting a nonprofit, no business uh, calling people to a board and no business hiring staff because what I really want to do 60 hours a week is podcast and meet one-on-one -on -one with people and do workshops and retreats to help them. But when you, when, as soon as your livelihood is based on um, the nonprofit, then, you know, and you've got kids who need therapy, who need, you know, food and clothes, and, and there's a mortgage, and they need to be sent to college. And all of a sudden, you're still very much feeling the financial stresses of, of what you would as a provider. It can make you feel very fearful and controlling about uh, about losing your source of income that you've invested so much in. And that leads you to live in fear sometimes mm -hmm. and paranoia mm -hmm. uh, and kind of a scarcity model that has just made, made it really hard uh, on everyone who's worked with me. So I'd say everyone, everyone on you know, I've tried to be grateful to everyone. I've tried to be kind to everyone. I've tried mm -hmm. to be gracious to everyone. I've tried to be generous with everyone. But I think almost everyone who's worked with me would say, John's hard to work with. John is, uh, he's scared a lot. He operates from a, from a position of fear and maybe even a little bit of paranoia. And um, he's scatterbrained and he takes on too much and he... Uh, you know, uh, he burns bridges. And so, so that's, that's been super hard. So there's that. And then there's just the fact that being a public figure comes with scrutiny, but not just scrutiny in this polarizing field of religious discourse and secular discourse, you, you can't avoid making enemies and not just enemies about people that will say he says I'm too much or, you know, he, uh, his interviews are too long or boring, which, you know, obviously that's, 
that's to be expected. Um, <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's people that grow to hate you sometimes for things you've done. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes for reasons you just will never understand. And from that will be people that want, that seem to want to destroy you. And having full knowledge of my tendency towards fear and paranoia. Um, nice awareness I, there. I have to check that. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, you know, that that's what I've experienced. People that want to do whatever they can to hurt you, to hurt your family, to hurt what you've built. Um, and that, that's really hard. It's like, you're always at emotional. It's always, it's like, you're always in an emotional war and, and that's not even counting the fact that we're in a very contentious space where the podcast that I do, the activism that we've tried to do just can leave you feeling bloody on the battlefield just because you're fighting, you're trying to fight to change an organization that has many good things, but tries to harm people. If you're, if you're in a battle mentality, you know, they say you live by the sword, you die by the sword. You're just always easily triggered into battle mode or fight mode or defensiveness mode. It's amygdala. It's all lots of amygdala. And so those things are very, very challenging. And then always having to make ends meet financially and always being fearful that with the wrong accusations, with the wrong attacks, everything could disappear. When you're in a point in your life where several kids are going to college, you've got to make the mortgage. You you finally have to replace the cars after 18 years or 15 years and get cars that have functioning airbags, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, please don't let this go away right now when my family needs it so much. And uh, that was a big answer. Uh, I don't think you, I don't know how much you expect me to go to all those places, but those are the hardest things about this job. <laughs> well, I'm feeling like a ton of anxiety <laughs> right Why's now that? from Why's that, that answer. Because well, there's a lot. I think it's true. I think you walk a lot you know, you walk around carrying quite a bit to be in this space. And I think what I see is you're really working to be aware of your peace in that and where the fear comes from. You know, I do think you have clearly some things in your own story growing up that come into play here. Like what? Um, Well, just money wise and stability wise, I think the story about your dad trying to you know, have his own business and some of the things that you witnessed with how sudden that turned around and he had to declare bankruptcy and, you know, just some of those emotional experiences when you were in your formative years, I I do see those as, you know, you lived a reality that a lot of kids, they don't conceive of that, you know, but you know, what happens, you saw it, you know, and you experienced it when you were feeling, you know, like life was pretty stable. So, I just kind of see, I can see why, you know, it can feel heavy at times for you. And the awareness, I think, is is kind of crucial. Yeah. I have a long way to go. <laughs> well, the awareness is the first step. Yeah. It's not the final step. It's yeah. not the final journey. But it is something without it. There's nowhere to go. So, you know? Yeah. So, um, what are a few of the interviews you've done that were pivotal to you in your process? You know, I've thought a lot about this, and there's a difference between you know certain interviews that really moved me, mm-hmm. and whether I've I've al- I've allowed those interviews to really work their way into my heart to change my heart and my behavior. Because ultimately, I I do like to have a growth mindset, but so when I think back to some of my favorite interviews, they're ones that most people won't remember. Like I interviewed Stephen Vesey, the president of Community of Christ, the president prophet of Community of Christ, or I interviewed the three interfaith amigos. Right, right. Um, these, you know, a, a Muslim imam, a, a rabbi, and a, a, a Christian priest. And I was really moved by all four of those men 
the level of kindness and warmth and compassion that they carried. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it was like in their presence, I've, I felt like these are holy, holy men. You know what I mean? Um, I feel that with Carolyn Pearson as well in many, in many respects. Um, what are the, what, how would you describe that? What are the things that make you feel like they're holy men? That felt like what to you when you were with them? What made you feel that way? And I just want to add, there, there, I don't want to just give a list of men because there are women too. I, I've honestly, I felt it in your interview. I felt it with Carolyn Pearson. I felt it with Natasha Helfer Parker. And there's going to be a whole host of people that I'm not mentioning uh, a lot of the faith crisis interviews that I've done with families, whether it's the Hackings or the Youngs, the Youngs or um, the Booths, mm -hmm. um, or the the Johnsons and the Checketses, and many of those families, the, you know, just grace under pressure, mm -hmm. kindness, forgiveness, warmth, poise, those sorts of things. Those are the ones that. Uh, impacted me the most but I say that with the big asterisk because I don't think like I think I've been so focused on surviving and achieving the objective of you know Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation that I have not taken the time to really let the feelings that I got David Bakavoy is another example by the way I have not let the emotional impact of coming into contact with those beautiful people really changed me because I, you know, you said this morning <laughs> that I'm, a, I'm in a, I have an avoidant personality and I, and I think that's true. In I, love, right? In true <laughs> warmth, I yeah. said that. <laughs> yeah. No, but, but really like, I think I could easily be a depressed person. I think I could easily be, um, let just in some ways worse than I am. Uh, but always having a goal, always having a mission, always mm -hmm. having a cause, always working hard. Let's is a is a way to yeah. keep the wheel in my in my mind. It's the way to it's control coping. Yeah, it's a way to not unravel. It's a way to not be vanquished. It's a way to not let your emotions or enemies pull you down. Like whenever I'm emotionally distressed, I can always just work, 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 achieve, you know, and it brings a sense of like gratification. It, it, people are grateful. Uh, I feel fulfilled. Um, I have a cause I'm productive. And so it gives me all those creative mm -hmm. warm fuzzies and, and accolade warm fuzzies, but it drains, it, you. Com it drains me, but it comes at a cost of my own introspection mm -hmm. and uh, personal growth and development. Like I, I have, uh, wielded the sword for so long now, 14 years Yeah, that I think being a warrior for a cause leaves you with battle scars and wounds and trauma that, um, and it never necessarily allows you to heal. And to yes. grow. Yes. So I think I lack. Now, why are you tearing up? Because I think you're being really vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense to me. I think this really worked for you when the wheels came off your vehicle when you were, you know, a teen, what worked for you? Your hustling worked. You got the best grades. You knew you were going to have to kind of provide for yourself. That wasn't going to be in the cards. You knew your parents probably couldn't take that on with all that they were. And I think it really worked in the sense that it, it brought you to the place you wanted to go and that you knew, you know, that you, um, that would help you build a life in essence, you know? And, uh, but yeah, that hustle. Yeah. One and thing then after the excommunication, 
No, I'm sorry. After I lost my faith in 2001 and I had those years of depression, I had to make meaning out of it or I was going to get really depressed, mm -hmm. losing my faith, sure. losing my source of spirituality, losing my identity. Yeah. And so this, it was, again, hustling was a way to just respond to a, a faith crisis that was devastating to sort of every aspect of my life. Mm -hmm. And there have been moments, I think, where that avoidant hustling caught up to you in very blindsiding ways. For sure. But how aware do you feel like you are day to day that this is really a way to cope, that it's a behavior you adapted that you use on a level to control the amount of pain that you feel. It, it's always there in the back of my mind that, uh, that I have a lot of personal work to do, that I'm a really flawed messenger and uh, that I've hurt way too many people. I've hurt, burned way too many bridges damaged way too many relationships, you know, in, and just, uh, neglected, you know, important relationships and my own personal development. It's always in the back of my mind. And I think, I think I, I tell myself, well, you got to keep making a living for the family. You got to keep providing for Margie and the kids. They've got to have Mm -hmm. They've got it. We've got to have health insurance and we've got to send them to college and we've got to make our mortgage. So that, I, that, that response allows me to kind of delay mm -hmm. the personal reckoning. Um, and, uh, but I, but I'm, I'm all, I'm haunted by the body count of, and I, I, I'm guessing my listeners will have no idea. Well, some listeners will have no idea what I'm talking about. You know what I mean? In terms of, relationships damaged or hurt, uh, you know, but it's, um, and I, I haven't wanted to bring that drama into Mormon stories because I don't think, you know, the Mormon post Mormon world needs more drama. And I don't, I never wanted Mormon stories to be about me. I always wanted it mm -hmm. to be about others. And I don't know how constructive it is for, you know, I, I hate it when, progressives or post-Mormons go at each other in public or tear each other down or, you know, and so I don't, I apologize if listeners have no idea what we're talking about. Um, but, but anyway, I'm, I, I, the, to answer your question, I, I am daily tormented by the lack of personal growth that I've been putting off and the, the collateral of broken relationships that, have been that has been amassed uh over the past 14 years and i have lots of dear friends and we've done a lot of good things so it's not all negative and and terrible and hard but i i think i live more with the failures and the the casualties than i do with the successes on a day-to-day -day basis because they really do haunt, haunt me all the time. Mm -hmm. Every day I'm like haunted by, by all the collateral damage in relationships that, that have come with this job in the way I've handled it. Yeah. I think that's one of the biggest, um, foils that I see in you is just what a huge connector you are. You are a builder of bridges. You love connecting with people and you, uh, and yet oftentimes, you know, you end up in these spaces where you're feeling really disconnected from people and you feel, you know, that you have, you know, I don't know, all these bridges that have been burned to the ground or, um, and so it's a really, it's a painful juxtaposition, I think, for your personality where you want connection so badly. And yet you oftentimes find yourself in relationships or situations where I find myself undermining the connections that I want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I hold that with you. 
And I will also say that another thing I didn't anticipate with the sense of your job was this level that you carry not just our story, but you carry thousands of stories. You carry thousands of traumas because you are written every day with people's stories, with that they have no one else to tell. No one else will hear it. No one else will hold it. And it reminds me kind of like a therapist, right? Where therapists need therapy because as human beings, you know, we're not all made to hold, you know, vast amounts of pain. The therapists that I know need help carrying what they carry, you know, and they, you can see it in their lives, the burden of, and they're amazing people, beautiful people, so glad they exist. But it's like, there is a cost to that. And you hold thousands of stories that you have heard over the years and you hold them all, you know? Hmm. Thank you, sweetie. What inspires you in life? Um, creative people inspire me, uh, courageous people inspire me, wise wisdom and in intelligence inspires me and wisdom, mm -hmm. uh, leadership inspires me. Mm -hmm. So I, there, I know there's another question there about like people that I admire, but it's like Oprah, um, uh, Maya Angelou, uh, Martin Luther King has always been a hero, Junior, Malcolm X, um, Jim Henson, uh, Winston Churchill, and specifically how he responded to the, to the Nazi kind of regime. M many of those people have been my heroes over time because of either, uh, their their courage, their honesty, their conviction to do what's right, um, their wisdom, their intelligence, those sorts of things. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Yeah, you are. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, what is something you like about yourself? Oh, by the way, can oh. I say one more thing? Gan Gandhi was in there too. Mm -hmm. What was the original question? The original question was what inspires you? Yeah. The, yeah, social justice stuff ins inspires me. That that when there when there are people who are downtrodden, people who are mistreated, people who are hurt, people who are damaged, people who are misunderstood, I I really uh, am inspired by trying to help and and I'm inspired by others who over his, history's time have tried to help mm -hmm. uh, those types of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gandhi's another example of that. Um, and the the thing that I, I learned, I read enough about Gandhi and Martin Luther King and Malcolm X to know the huge, massive price that they paid. Gandhi didn't have a great relationship with his wife or kids. Um you know, Winston Churchill struggled in many of those ways. Obviously, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X ended up dead. Mm -hmm. They did not have the best relationships sometimes with their family members. Um, they had a hidden lives that were sometimes really controversial. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, when I thought I might be getting into this realm of activism, I knew a lot of I knew a lot of leaders that. Uh, could make a difference. I knew leaders that were able to do it and, and financially sustain it. I did know a lot of civil rights leaders that were able to keep their family together mm -hmm. and um, do it in a healthy way that was where their marriage and their relationships with their kids could not just remain intact, but, but still be healthy for everyone involved. Mm -hmm. So one of the hardest things for me has been trying to to be someone that tries to fight for social justice as flawed as I am, but also to keep our relationship strong and to be a good dad mm -hmm. while still making a living. And that I think you'll find it's a full plate. It's 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 
it's hard to do two of the three. It's almost impossible to do all three. Mm-hmm. To stand stand for social justice and make a difference while making ends meet financially, mm-hmm. while not destroying your marriage or really neglecting your kids. Mm-hmm. And you can just see, you know, even in our community, not not everyone's been able to keep their marriage intact or not everyone's been able to survive financially. Like if you look at a lot of the social justice activists, not you know, in Mormonism and post-Mormonism, the marriage has been the casualty or the kids have been the casualty or they haven't been able to do it financially and, uh, you know, sustain it financially. And that's, it's just, it's incredibly hard. I, it's, you know, it's hard yeah. and it's hard, not just in Mormonism, pick any, any, any realm. It's just, it's, it's exciting cause it's really challenging, but it's, it's super hard mm-hmm. <laughs> every day. I'm torn between feeling like I'm the luckiest guy in the world and really wanting it all to end because it sometimes feels like too much to carry. And it's just too, it's, it's too difficult to to keep all those three things in balance and together without wrecking our marriage or wrecking our kids or wrecking my relationship with our kids or having it financially implode or cease being effective as a, someone trying to fight for social justice. It's, it's super hard. <laughs> it is. And I think we've had to kind of adjust and really learn as we go. So, and boundarying was a huge, huge gift to our family. When you started, you took it outside the home, you know, for so long, it was part of our family life, honestly. Margie's and- talking about, well, last year she kicked me out. Basically she, she, in January of 2018, she basically said, Mormon, Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation will no longer be run out of our home because Mormon Stories was run out of our home from 2005 until late 2017. Long, it was a good long so run. 13 years. <laughs> so I'd always be doing my interviews in a room or in the basement or and it could be echoed throughout the house. And Or I'd distressing bre- phone calls were really, yeah, like you people know, things calling, that we all help. felt or we all not because you were out and about taking those phone calls you were always private but you can always feel and hear pain over so or visitors or visitors or visitors yeah. yeah we've learned as we've gone but uh, can I I'm going to challenge you on the growth kind of segment that you said a question or two ago about you not being as I actually feel like a, you you've done you have done the work over the years and there's been a huge shift what in work? the last year. Your own work. I think sometimes we've been blindsided by things. Uh, we you don't know what you don't know. You know, we there's always room for improvement, right? But you're broad stroking a lot of the character traits that I love most in you, which is you are growth mindset, and you do take feedback from our kids now. You take it from me. We're in a new day, and that took a lot of work over the last year. And there's been times in our marriages where we burned our marriage down and you and I had to be willing to do a ton of work to rebuild. And you were always, you were there, you know, working. So I see you very much as growth mindset. I do see work as a particularly tricky space. Yeah. Um, okay. What is something that you struggle with, with regards to yourself? So, wait, did I ask you what you like about yourself? No. All right, wait, I want to start there. What's something you like about yourself? (laughs) I hate this question. Really? Um, I. There's so much to love. Come on now. (laughs) What is this? I think that I, I, I like to, it's maybe illusion, but I like to feel like my heart's in the right place. Even if I'm, I think of myself as like a bull in a china shop. Because even if I'm thrashing around, knocking everything down, causing b- burning bridges or causing emotional damage sometimes, I do have the impression or the perception that I, that I start from a place of good intentions mm-hmm. <laughs> to really help and alleviate suffering and to promote healing and joy. So I, I like that about myself, that I, mm-hmm. I'm not, you know, that I'm not just trying to make a crap ton of money or I'm not just trying to uh, be famous or 
you know, that I, that I really do am trying to spend my years, my minutes, my time helping others. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think I have good intentions and, uh, I feel like my heart, I try to keep my heart in the right place. Um, I think that's maybe at the core. Uh, I think I, I think I'm determined. I think I work, I think I work hard. I think I try to listen and learn, but I, I'm not always good at changing. So, but I, I want, I want to have a growth mindset. I want to learn from my mistakes. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that sense, those are some, a couple things. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Those? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I could make a big old long list, but yeah, that was a great, that's a great start. And I like hearing what you value about yourself. Okay. So what's something that you struggle with about yourself and please don't do like a huge old long list now. Like you list two things that you like about yourself. Now you're going to do like 10 things. Let's not. Yeah, I don't, I don't, um, I have struggled to, uh, I've struggled with relationships with people. Just, I have relationships for a time and then so many relationships seem to go sour and, and I honestly feel like I often have some block to really understand what, you know, what happens there. So that's something that I really struggle with. I think also I, one of the reasons I mentioned the three amigos and Carolyn Pearson and Steve Veazey and a lot of those, you know, David Bakavoy, all those other things is, and you is I really admire people who are conscious and kind of enlightened. And I, I feel like I wish, I really want to be more conscious and enlightened and wise and non-reactive. And I even teach the principles to others when I coach and, and the, you know, when I've done therapy in the past, I know that meditation and mindfulness and non-reactivity are the ways to achieve that. And I've even tried meditating in the past, but uh, I'm frustrated at my inability to become wiser and, and deeper and more compassionate mm-hmm. and more conscious mm-hmm. and less reactive. I'm disappointed by my emotional reactivity where I let anger or fear uh, get the best of me too often. I think a lot of people feel like Mormon Stories has lost. Some people express that they really enjoyed Mormon Stories when they felt like it was more even-handed and objective. Because I've always tried to balance believers and non-believers, respect for all, uh, interview people in respectful ways. Um, but And some people feel like I'm still balanced and objective, but other people feel like a couple of years before the excommunication and since Mormon stories has lost some of its, uh, objectivity and neutralness and, and that sort of stuff. Mm. And, and then I do think about kind of the peacemakers and the bridge builders versus the, the path I've taken. And I, I, to the extent it's hard to know how much of that's true mm-hmm. because I still get feedback, John, you're the most balanced, interviewer that I know, I still get that feedback, but I've also lost a lot of my former audience. So it's hard to know exactly where I stand there, but to the extent to which I have erred on the side of, well, my behaviors have led to more division, more bridge burning, more divisiveness in the community, uh, versus understanding and connection. I regret that. Mm. Okay. So describe a version of a perfect day for you. Hmm. Well, I, I get a full night's sleep, which is sometimes rare. So I would, I would wake up at six instead of four, (laughs) Mm -hmm. um, or three, (laughs) I would, uh, cuddle with you in bed. Um, 
do some mindfulness with you in bed before I, I get out of bed, cuddle with you, connect with you. I would go exercise because I do better when I exercise. I would get back in time to send the kids off like we do each morning, but be really present and connected with the kids mm -hmm. so that they feel my my presence and connection and I'm not distracted in my brain or worrying about something, you know. Uh, I come to work, put a, put a good day's work in where I'm creating. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not putting up fire fires. I'm not getting dragged into contention or drama, but I'm... I'm doing something creative that's yeah. meaningful to people. Um, good meals along the way. I love food. So I would have good meals along the way that were healthy but yummy. And uh, yeah, then I just come home and and connect with the family. Uh, you know, yesterday Claire and I went through the Frisbee for an hour or two and I was able to be there with her and connect with her. Mm -hmm. We went to Nielsen's Frozen Custard afterwards we connected with Winston at night. Like when I'm, a good day includes me connecting with you and also the kids mm -hmm. where they feel my presence in their lives, my love, my support. When they're able to open up to me and I'm able to receive their openness with presence mm -hmm. and uplift instead of my own fears or my own mm -hmm. desires for them. I know you're going to talk about conscious parenting later, but... It involves connecting with my kids and you in meaningful ways. It probably involves, you know, family dinner, and then it involves, you know, you and I snuggling up uh, at night. <laughs> what are, you, are you winking? <laughs> some loving? Is that what you're winking at? <laughs> There's maybe some physical intimacy. Some late night connecting. <laughs> I know that's on your list. <laughs> that's on my list. Um, but also I really enjoy whether you and I are walking together, that's a long mm -hmm. tradition we have of walking and talking or, um, also watching a, a cool TV show, a fun TV show with you at night in bed, which right We've, now which would be, we watch, uh, we're rewatching parenthood, but we are watching, uh, the good place right now, uh, and, uh, we, we have, I could list 20 shows that we've watched, over the, years. Uh, over the years, but, but it involves that. And then cuddling up with you to go to bed. Yeah. That's a perfect it's day. A, that's a good day. <laughs> that a and good if I day. can throw my brother or my sister or my, my parents kind of extended family in there, I, I really treasure. Yeah. My a day is kind of hard. Almost over a week is yeah. a little bit kinder cause you have more Yeah. and you are a very devoted son brother you take all those I relationships really seriously and i love it when i can connect with friends that i've made in the community mm -hmm. in spite of all my self-flagellation today I, I have made a lot of friends and long-term friends i'm gonna say i realize really through this conversation that you are structurally very hard on yourself really i didn't realize quite to uh you know what extent you were because you are a profoundly amazing dad in the sense of showing up, seeking time with your kids every week, even the ones that have moved out, you know, seeking to take feedback, to be safer, to get your stuff out of the way, admitting mistakes, working harder. And I would say that as, you know, a partner too, not that we don't separate for a while or meaning like we have differentiation, we have different projects that you can get distracted, but you're always very aware of coming back or, hey, I've been distracted for a day. I, I want to connect with you. How can we do that? I feel like you're very sensitive to that. Thanks, sweetie. Anyway, <laughs> you're hot on yourself, man. Uh, so three people that you would most want to interview for Mormon stories that you haven't yet. I would love to interview, you know, any of the like top of first presidency or, you know, I'd love to interview Russell M. Nelson oh, or, uh -huh. you know, or, uh, um, Don H. Oaks or Jeffrey Holland or in the past Boyd K. Packer or, mm. um, some, you know, the other leaders, especially the ones that are more controversial. Okay. I mean, I, 
I feel like I could do a really good job of humanizing them. Like some of my favorite interviews in Mormon stories were like Sean McCraney or uh, Sandra Tanner, you know, where people had this really strong impression of someone or even Daniel Peterson, though I didn't conduct the interview, where people have this really strong mm-hmm. preconceived notion about somebody. Yeah. And maybe they're polarizing or controversial, but you're able to dig deeper and really humanize them and show where they're coming from and show their true intent and motives where you're like, oh man, I get it now and I love them. And you made, you know, kind of, I think why you're interviewing me, uh, I love to do that to other people. Mm -hmm. So I would love, like with Russell M. Nelson or or Dallin H. Oaks, I would love to say, yeah, yeah, like what made you talk about your LGBT issues, talk about these decisions you've made recently, talk about how you view the church and why you make the decisions you do. And what, what is it about your background or your experiences that have led you to lead in the way that you lead or to say the things that you have said, um, as a way to humanize them and to help us understand them better and to, to really help them express themselves in, in authentic ways. That'd be really super meaningful to me. And of course it's never going to happen, or at least I can't imagine it ever happening, but that's kind of one class of answering your question. Mm -hmm. I would love to interview Joseph Smith, uh, you know, going back in history Mm -hmm. to really get to the bottom of who he was and why he did what he did. Because I really do think that if any of us were born with Joseph Smith's DNA, Joseph Smith's upbringing, we would act identically to him because I think ultimately we are our DNA our brains, our upbringing, our environment. I think Mm. that in many ways kind of unfolds who we become. Otherwise, what is it? You know, is it, is there a spirit or some sort of consciousness? I'm not a big believer in independent spirits or independent consciousness. And so if it's not some co-eternal spirit or intelligence, then it's gotta be where our brains, where our DNA were the chemicals that were the way our brains came together and then were a response to the experiences that we have. And so I would love to be able to really understand Joseph Smith or even Jesus and understand what, what they were about, Mm -hmm. why they did, why they said what they said, why they did what they did, who they really are. Uh, and then, um, Yeah, and then, the, the, you know, there'd be some celebrity Mormon celebrities like, you know, Dan Reynolds or Steve Young, Stephen Barb Young or the Donnie Marie Osmond. You know, the, they're always kind of other, you know, Mitt Romney. <laughs> really prominent celebrity type Mormons. Got it. Would be really fun. So let's take a slice oh, of Oh, and Leah Remini. I really want to interview Leah Remini. Oh, okay. So that I feel like would almost go for this question because then I just asked, uh, just as an interviewer, three interviews. So not necessarily tied to Mormon stories, but what are a few interviews you'd love to have just in general? Oh, um, people dead or alive? Yeah, just a few people that come to mind. Like this would be an interesting interview or I've always- Yeah, I'd love to interview Kaim Potok, who's my favorite author- who wrote The Chosen, who wrote The Promise, who wrote mm-hmm. My Name is Asher Lev, who wrote Davida's Harp, who uh, wrote about the evolution of religion and mm-hmm. the secularization of religion and the clash of religion and modernity. Uh, his books have inspired me so much. and Or, you know, Reform Judaism has inspired me so much that uh, I would love to interview Kaim Potok. I don't think he's still alive, but that would be a dream interview. Yeah. Um, uh, who else would I want to interview? Help me out. <laughs> well, I think Leah Remini. Leah Remini, yeah. Would you want to interview Oprah or someone like that? Or Yeah, interviewing Oprah or Brene Brown. Brene uh, Brown, yeah. You know, going back in time, uh, Martin Luther King, How Malcolm about, X, um, Gandhi, Jim Henson, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, what about the podcaster you've been listening Franklin to? Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> True. What about the podcaster yeah. that you've been listening to recently? Um, who did Zucked? Yeah. I don't know his name. Oh, Sam, like Sam Harris. Yeah. Would you want to So you have in there Harris? some of my favorite podcasts. Like I. Oh yeah. That's, no, you can't go there. Okay. Yet. Okay. So. 
But would you would you want to interview Sam Harris? Yeah, Sam Harris okay. would be fascinating. Elaine de Bouton yeah. would be oh, yeah, would be would fascinating. Be fascinating mm-hmm. um, okay. Yeah, lots of people. That's a, that's a great taste. <laughs> I would love to be a general interviewer, you know, of people beyond religion and beyond Mormonism. That would be a real dream. It's always been your dream, huh? Yeah, to be like a, I don't want to use Charlie Rose's example because he got, you know, uh, me too and I, you know, I don't want, but that Oprah, just that position of interviewer I cherish and part of me would love to take that outside of religion and Mormonism. Yeah. What are some of your favorite ways to decompress? So, uh, sleep, food, sex, um, chess, karaoke, uh, m- news, uh, s- not news, I think sports sometimes, mm-hmm. jacuzzi, oh, yeah. or uh, baths. Every night I take a bath. Sure do. Uh, those are some of the ways. And, and getting together with people that I love and trust and connect with. Mm-hmm. And can just be yourself around. Yeah, and I don't have to be John the podcaster, John the religious pundit. Yeah. Um, you know, I can just be me and not have to, yeah, wear the, wear the hats. 